All right, we're gonna uh, get started. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you tonight. My name is Karina Nielsen, and uh, I'm a marine ecologist, but I'm disguised as the director of the only marine laboratory on San Francisco Bay. <laughs> um, and just, uh, uh, I'm gonna give a few remarks about who we are, just so that you all know. Um, we are a research and service organization, part of San Francisco State University. Um, we have numerous faculty, students, and staff here um, who are based actually out here, uh, who work with the university and in various departments. We also partner and host uh, a NOAA program called the San Francisco Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the reserve program, uh, we, uh, we help steward 3,700 acres of gorgeous estuary habitat at China Camp. Many of you are familiar with China Camp. Uh, and also at Rush Ranch over in Solano County. Um, we are also home to the West Coast Extension of the Smithsonian Institute's Environmental Research Center. Um, and we're also a research partner in their Marine Global Earth Observatory with a site right here in your backyard in Richardson Bay. Uh, we've been doing two years of research uh, at that site and we hope to continue that in uh, perpetuity uh, for, for many, many years. Um, it is my pleasure tonight to welcome all of you to the Barbara and Richard Rosenberg Institute Fall Public Forum. Uh, the Rosenberg's leadership and generosity make it possible for us to bring you this program uh, to the community and to offer you uh, lovely refreshments, and we are very, very grateful for their leadership. I'm also really thrilled uh, to have San Francisco State leadership here with us tonight, um, and I'd like to ask them to stand as I introduce them. We have President and First Lady of San Francisco State, Les and Phyllis Wong, if you would just. We also have, thank you so much for coming. We also have our provost, Jennifer Summit. Um, we also have our dean of the College of Science and Engineering, Carmen Domingo, Dr. Carmen Domingo, is she? There she is, oh, she's back there, hi. Um, so welcome to all of you. We also have other folks here from San Francisco State. I'm sure some of you have had a chance to chat with them earlier in the evening. So real strong show of support from our uh, uh, parent institution. I am also really excited tonight, and some of you may have gotten a hint of this if you looked at name tags. Um, you, we consider the people who come to these programs and who are interested in the environment and science and the work that we do um, are really special friends. Uh, and we wanted to let you know that we're on the cusp of launching a new name for ourselves, a new identity, if you will. Um, it's a companion to our newly refreshed mission and vision. Uh, we have a couple of I's left to dot and T's left to cross. We're part of a 23 campus system uh, with uh, the Chancellor's Office down in Long Beach, so there's a campus level approval process and a chancellor's level approval process. But at the campus, President Wong and Provost Summit have enthusiastically endorsed our new name and program and we wanted to share it with you tonight. Um, very soon, you will hear about us as the Estuary and Ocean Science Center. <laughs> there is a short form. <laughs> um, uh, if you prefer, uh, the EOS Center. And some of you may know who EOS is, and I'll, I'll let you look that up, but uh, it's appropriate. Um, this new name will allow us to really better communicate our mission and vision, which is to connect science, society, and the sea for a healthy planet. I think that's something we can all get behind. Um, as part of our new mission, I wanted to make just uh, an, a an announcement of a new uh, program, public program that we're launching. It's a film series in partnership with the International Ocean Film Festival. And I'd like to introduce just briefly Ana Blanco, who's the executive director. Are you sitting in here, Ana? Ana Blanco. Our first film will be a screening of Blue Serengeti. 
Uh, it's an award-winning film about shark and shark research right here out in the Gulf of the Farallons. It's going to be screened November 16th in this room. So look for uh, information about that soon. And it's going to be accompanied by discussion and hosted by a shark expert, David McGuire, who's also here, the director of Shark Stewards. And we're really excited about this. They're going to be quarterly screenings, so um, look forward to a lot of films. They're going to be in the late afternoon, early evening. So if you have kids who might be interested in science, it's a great opportunity to bring them. Um, we are also about to launch a campaign to raise, yes, money. <laughs> $6 million is what we're aiming for. We'd like to raise that to help us continue the chain of training the next generation of scientists. We need to give them a place to learn the modern tools of science, and we propose to do this by completing our Delta Hall Research Building and a new state-of-the-art climate-controlled aquatic research and wetland greenhouse facilities. As you know, Climate change is probably one of the most existential crises of our time right now. At this moment in time, there couldn't be more important work than to continue to train scientists to study this problem and to inform our decision-making process and governance going forward in a democratic society. So we are thrilled to have a lead gift for this for the Wetlands Greenhouse in particular, from our longtime volunteer and dear friend, John Kern, who is here, and I wanted to thank John for his leadership <laughs> gift. It really means the word to, world to us. Thank you. Um, and now, without further ado, thank you for listening to the introductory remarks, but uh, I am super, super excited, couldn't be more excited than to introduce and welcome our special guest for this evening, um, Dr. John Foley, who's the Executive Director of the California Academy of Sciences. He is also the William R. and Gretchen B. Kimball Chair at the Cal Academy. John is not only a world-renowned scientist recognized for his work on sustainability of our planet and, ecos and the ecosystems we all depend on, he is author of hundreds of scientific publications, a science advisor to governments, environmental groups, foundations, non-governmental organizations, businesses, um, you name it. He has written articles for the popular press as well, or for the news media, the New York Times, National Geographic, Scientific American. He is a great translator of science to humanity. Um, he is also an incredible champion of science, and frankly, I consider him one of the thought leaders of our time. Some of you may know him from social media, where he's actively followed by many. I encourage you to check that out. Um, he's here tonight. He's going to talk to us about uh, a new vision, planet vision, a new way of thinking about a sustainable future. Please help me welcome John Foley. <laughs> I'm always so embarrassed when people introduce you, you know, like that. That's just so over the top. And I'm just only going to let you down now. So, <laughs> you know. Um, well, first of all, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, it's really lovely to be here at the uh, former uh, uh, Tiburon Center, I guess, EOS. We'll have to call it from now on. So we'll have to remember where we are. Uh, and also, I gather none of you are baseball fans. I mean, what, what, what gives? <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm like, it's game seven of the World Series. No one's going to be here tonight. Um, at least if the Giants or somebody were playing, somebody really good were playing, you wouldn't be here tonight, right? So uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, hell, I wouldn't be here tonight. Um, so <laughs> anyway, uh, well, thank you all for being here tonight. So um, yeah, I was I was asked to kind of talk about uh, kind of sustainability issues and kind of what we're seeing on this time on planet Earth and um, the role of science and how we connect to society. And so you know, clearly this there are going to be some discussions around ecology and climate change and the science behind this, policy issues, technology, and so on. But you know, when you kind of think about this time on planet Earth, I actually like to begin thinking about history. Uh, and one of the things that's so, so important about our time on planet Earth, because, you know, we've been on this planet a very, very long time. Uh, the anthropologists tell us that, you know, something like a human being, uh, kind of proto-humans, have walked this planet for about six million years. 
Um, that's like 300,000 generations of something like us being born, living, and dying, 300,000 generations. Just think about that. And for almost all of that time, I would say 299,998 of those generations, one fact was undeniably true. The earth was big and we were small, period. We could do anything we wanted. In fact, it was a good strategy to increase our population, to use more resources, to spread out as far and wide as we possibly could. So we use that strategy again and again and again, use up resources, pollute when necessary, and move on to the next place and spread out and do it again and again and again. And that guaranteed the success and survival of our species, in fact. But, and that was a very logical strategy for our species to do what it did until the last two generations when suddenly everything flipped around and now the earth is very, very small and we suddenly became very, very big. And that happened during our time on planet Earth. We've switched from what we would call an empty world, a world uh, where we were very small and resources were infinite, to a full world uh, where our civilization now takes up more than a planet's worth of resources. So, you know, how did that happen? Why did that all happen so suddenly and so dramatically during our lifetimes? Well, one of the reasons, of course, is just a lot more of us on the planet. For all of human history until very recently, we were just a couple hundred million uh, primates walking around the planet. Uh, we only reached the first billion in the late 18th century, uh, then the second billion in the early 20th century. Today, we're about 7.4 billion. So a lot of us just lived through this explosive growth of human numbers that happened very, very quickly. And populations are, the good news is, we're slowing down every year, we're adding fewer people than we did last year, which is good, but we're still adding people and we'll top off and come to an equilibrium, probably around nine to 10 billion later in the 21st century, early 22nd century. That's good news, but uh, we're still adding people and seven billion is hard, eight billion is harder, nine billion harder yet. So we have to think about that, of course. But a much more dramatic change was, of course, our technology and use of resources. Uh, this is a map of what Earth looks like at night from outer space. These are just pictures. Uh, and I don't even need to draw boundaries. You can tell that that's India and that that's Japan and that's South Korea and that's not North Korea. And, uh, <laughs> oh wait, you see that light on? That's Kim's house. Um, um, I hope he's not on Twitter. No, but I really hope he's not on Twitter, actually. <laughs> um, anyway, so, you know, we can see that our, you know, we're, you can see the planet from, you know, outer space at night. You can see our population, our energy use, our cities, and our thriving economy and technology and resource use. And if you think about it, during the last, you know, let's say 50 years, we've seen an incredible change in our species and in our culture and our technology and everything. If you just look at the last 50 year period, let's say, uh, the world's population more than doubled during that same time, and, but the economy grew sevenfold during the same time, adjusted for inflation. So twice as many people doing seven times more stuff around the planet. We consume three times more food, three times more water, and four times more fossil energy than we did 50 years ago. Uh, I'm about to turn 50 next year, so that's like my lifetime, probably a lot of yours as well. And if you think about it, there have been more changes in the last 50 years, not only than any other period in history, we changed more in the last 50 years than six million years of our existence before that. The entire sum of human evolution and history combined has changed more in one lifetime. So that's really extraordinary. Whether, whether you like it or not, we're hitting an inflection point in the existence of our species. Everything is changing. Even the way we're changing is changing right now. So that's, that's a pretty interesting moment to be alive. Um, and you know, as an environmental scientist, um, this was introduced, I've worked on a lot of scary issues like climate change and deforestation and extinction, all this kind of stuff. Well, I first of all, I realized I wasn't getting invited to parties anymore. Um, <laughs> um, but second, of that happens actually, <laughs> yeah. Um, the thing that was more unsettling though is I think we're always looking at the glass as half empty. And maybe it is, but there is still a glass and there's something in it. And so we, we should kind of pause and think about that a little bit and realize that actually at least some things are getting a lot better. Um, not everything for sure, but in fact, we're living at a time that's incredibly vibrant and successful. And we're standing on the shoulders of 300,000 generations before us 
that sacrificed so much for us to live incredibly rich and full lives today. So we live the best lives in human history today. And we sometimes take that for granted, but just think about it. Uh, again, just in the last 50 years, life expectancies globally rose from 55 to 70 in only 50 years. Uh, families are much smaller now. The average family has two and a half children compared to five only 50 years ago. But look at this. Literacy jumped from 50% to 85%. Uh, we are now much more urban. 55% of us live in cities. We have uh, six and a half times more mobility than we did 50 years ago. We're much, we 80 to 90 times more telecommunications capabilities in terms of the number of people who have access to a phone, let alone what you do with it. And, uh, and we're also, if you believe Steven Pinker, many fewer people die from violence and warfare now than ever in human history. So while we still have a lot of problems today, to be sure, we're living in the, uh, the time with the longest, safest, and most just, and most educated, and um, least warlike period in all of human history. It may not feel like that some days, but actually we're pretty blessed to live in this time. So that's the good news. But, and this is where my environmentalist comes back, uh, we're doing this often at the expense of the planet. We're degrading a lot of our planetary systems, things we really depend on, and I'll go through those in a minute, and we're leaving a tremendous burden for future generations. Uh, we may be the first generation in history to deliberately, because we're aware of it, leave a poorer world for the future. Every other generation behind us tried to leave a better world for their descendants. We're leaving a degraded world, unless we change our, our trajectory fast. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So how are we burdening future generations? Well, we're doing it in many different ways, and this is not meant to be a litany of doom, but it is important that we know what's going on. Uh, one of the things we're doing is very obvious. No one would argue about this. Uh, we're degrading the land resources of our planet. We're tearing down, in this case, a tropical rainforest to graze a little bit more cattle to uh, make some more beef in the middle of the Amazon rainforest. If we step back and look at that place from the, uh, from the air, from a satellite, uh, here's that scene in 1975. There's one rancher out there in that one little place in a dirt road going through the rainforest. We can come back to exactly the same place in 2003. Yeah, and this is all now cattle and soybeans being grown in the Amazon. Uh, the cattle for consumption within Brazil, the rest is actually soybeans being shipped mainly to China to feed pigs uh, in, in feedlots in Asia, half a planet away. If actually you step back and look at the entire planet, and this is what I used to do before coming to the Cal Academy, um, this is a map of every farm in the world using satellites and ground-based data. All the green areas are where we grow crops, things like corn and wheat and soybeans and whatnot, and all the brown areas are where we grow animals, uh, our cattle and basically our pastures and rangelands. Together, that's about 40% of all the land on Earth is used to grow food. All the world's cities and suburbs is less than 1%. So our, our biggest footprint on the planet isn't sprawl, it's food. And 75% of that total area is only one kind of food, meat. So uh, that's, you know, we have about an Africa plus half of South America's worth of land just growing meat or the crops that feed animals that become meat. So diets matter. We use almost a whole planet worth of land uh, to satiate our desire for meat and dairy products. Turns out that matters. Uh, we're also degrading water resources around the planet, uh, primarily for food. Turns out this is the biggest use of water on Earth. 70% of the water on the planet is used to do one thing, irrigate crops. 20% is used for industry, 10% is used in the home. Uh, this is a picture looking at the uh, airplane window flying into Phoenix, and what we're seeing here is iceberg lettuce being grown, I'm serious, <laughs> in the middle of the Arizona desert, uh, with which, um, and this is like a center pivot irrigation system, but that's not an irrigation machine, that's, a, uh, that's an evaporation machine actually. Uh, this, if you wanted to evaporate water really quickly, that's exactly what you would design. <laughs> Seriously, I've asked students over the years, like, could you design a machine that wastes water more than that? No one's been able to do it yet. So this is an incredibly inefficient use of water, and this is why the Colorado River no longer flows to the ocean, is because of things like this. And we certainly do a lot of this in California, too. 80% uh, of the water in California is used for crops. In fact, alfalfa is the biggest user of, of water in the state. Number two would be all of the Californians combined, uh, and all the cities and towns are number two after alfalfa. 
Almonds are number three. So that's pretty interesting. Now, we're not alone in doing this. It's not just the United States. Uh, here's an example from the former Soviet Union of the Aral Sea here in Central Asia. This is a big inland sea surrounded by desert. You see all that sand around there? That's sand. Um, what you see here is basically a large depression filled with water because there's a river here and one here that drains snowmelt way, way over there by that fire alarm. And that's, um, that's kind of over by China, and uh, snow melts there and drains down into this big basin, not unlike the Sierras, feeding snow melt into the bay from, from uh, along rivers and so on. Uh, the, the Soviets, though, dammed up these rivers and then used the water to irrigate the deserts of Kazakhstan to grow cotton, of all things. Uh, you can imagine what happened, though, to the Aral Sea if you dammed up its water supply. It did this. Um, so this is about 200 miles across, by the way. Uh, this is a very large, used to be one of the great inland seas of the world, and we drained it. Uh, and this is not just an environmental disaster, this is a human disaster. There are whole cities on the edge of the inland sea that are now wastelands uh, with no jobs, no fisheries, no commerce, piers stranded in the desert, and also some of the highest cancer rates on Earth are found in this region. Uh, the Soviet Union didn't have an EPA uh, or a Sierra Club, or what we, we used to have one too, I think, called the EPA. Remember that? <laughs> It was a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, they would dump God knows what uh, into the bottom of the sea and that stuff's becoming airborne now. Uh, so this is really pretty disturbing what might be going on there. So the point here is that water resources are, are being overused and overtaxed in so many different places, not just California, but also Lake Chad in Iran, in the Aral Sea, in the Colorado Basin, the Agawal Aquifer. It could go on for the hundreds of examples like this. And that's a major problem. So we're kind of degrading the world's land resource base, our water base. Those are nice and visible. We can understand and see those changes right now, right before our eyes. But this one is one that somehow we have a hard time wrapping our head around. But we're also degrading the air above us. We're, we're, we're degrading the sky. And that's kind of hard for us to accept. Uh, I think it's because, frankly, because we're short. <laughs> we're this tall. We look up and the sky looks infinite, doesn't it? They're like, it goes on forever. You know, all, all, every culture put their gods in the sky. We would talk about it as the infinite realm above our heads. But that ignores a very basic scientific fact, which is the atmosphere is actually a very small place. We're just really tiny. Uh, it turns out the atmosphere is only about 10 kilometers thick. The lower atmosphere, where all of our oxygen is, where our weather is, where our water comes from, all of our food comes from this, and our weather and our climate, all happen in about a six to seven mile thick layer of air. Seven miles, that's the width of San Francisco. You can drive across San Francisco and you didn't end up in outer space. Well, you might feel like it some days, but you know, especially on beta breakers or something, but um, it's not, you know, it's a, so if we drove straight up, we're in the stratosphere and eventually into the, into the you know, outer space essentially, but you drive horizontally, we don't notice it. Uh, but we have changed the sky because it's not as big as we thought. And it turns out we've changed it significantly. Today, in fact, uh, the CO2 levels in Hawaii, where we measure these things all the time, is about 405 parts per million, which is the highest level probably in five million years. Uh, it used to be 270 back before we started burning coal and oil and natural gas and tearing down rainforest. Uh, now it is about 50% higher, and there's no signs of that slowing down right now that we're gonna have to and we're gonna talk about that later. So we've changed the land, we've changed our waters, and we've changed the sky, uh, and we're just getting started. So what we're doing is we are degrading at the global scale. And let me back up. There are always local environmental issues. There's always something in our backyards. But at the global scale, everyone in the world can report in and say, yep, the ecosystems around us are being degraded. Everybody on the planet will say that. Everyone else will also say, yes, we're also globally depleting key natural resources, forest, soils, fresh water, and so on. And finally, another thing we all have in common together, no matter what part of the world you're in, the climate above us is changing, and we're noticing it already. So those are three systemic global environmental issues that everybody has. Now, locally, there might be other things, like the fisheries near your house, the trash on the beach, the landfill, the air around you. Those vary very um, contextually from region to region, but globally, ecosystems, natural resources, and climate touch every one of us on the planet almost exactly the same way. And we have to pull together and learn how to solve them together 
Otherwise, we don't stand a chance to do that. The thing we're finding is, you know, those are common issues. We're pushing our planet beyond its limits. We're not just, there's no other continent to go to. There aren't other water resources that haven't been untapped. We don't have another sky to go to. So unlike all of our uh, ancestors who could spread out and find a new environment, we've done it. There's just one planet and here we are. So that's really the kind of challenge of our time. Uh, most of this, which is, this sounds like very, very bad news, by the way, right? <laughs> Have you noticed that? <laughs> this is kind of dark at the moment. But the good news is, or maybe one good news is, all of that, almost all of it, like over 90% of what I just talked about is caused by three things, and only three. These are the three that matter, folks. If you're gonna solve the environmental problems of our time, we have to reinvent three things. We have to reinvent how we use and produce food, first of all, that's number one. Number two, water. And third, energy. If we can reinvent the way we use and produce our food, our water, and our energy, those strong problems go away completely. This is doable. And let me show you how we're gonna do it. But first of all, we need to think about it a little bit differently. The biggest problem we've had, I think, is that we keep on talking about this as if it's an environmental problem. How many of you would call yourselves an environmentalist? Okay, you are not like the rest of America. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's a self-selecting audience here. If you ask the average American audience, about 3% of you would have raised your hands. Would first, a lot of people aren't anti-environment, but that's not how they'd first use that word. But if you asked how many of you are human beings, hopefully all of you would raise your hands. <laughs> Well, maybe a few wouldn't, I don't know. You know, it's a Bay Area, you never know. Um, but this is more than an environmental problem because this is more than about birds and bees and polar bears and redwood trees. And, you know, you might care about that, but it might not be number one on your list. But all of us belong to civilization. And if our civilization can't sustain itself, if it can't produce its food and its water and its energy without undermining the planet we depend on, you don't get to have one of those. You know, if you want a civilization, you've got to figure out how to do it in a way that doesn't degrade your future, but in fact enhances your future. So we have to kind of reinvent our civilization. We have to go from that old way of doing things, from the empty world part of human history, where it's okay to exploit resources, pollute, and move on. In fact, that was a good strategy for so long, for millions of years, that made sense. Now it doesn't because there's nowhere else to go. So we have to overcome six million years of our evolutionary you know, kind of selection and our human history for 10,000 years to reinvent everything we've ever done in the next 20 years. I think we can do it, actually. I'm pretty excited about it. This is pretty cool, um, but it's gonna be a challenge. But we at first have to really make sure we take a very different approach. Now that approach we often call sustainability. Uh, how many of you heard that word before, right? Everybody, yeah. <laughs> I hate this word so much. <laughs> the bloody passion, I hate this word. Because it is so, well, first of all, it doesn't mean anything, and it means everything at the same time. But also, it's so boring. If I were to ask you, like, hey, how's your marriage? You said, oh, it's sustainable. <laughs> you know, I'd be like, oh, dude, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, like, that sucks. <laughs> you, know, you know, like, who wants that? You know, nobody wants sustainable, you know, that sounds awful. Um, but you know what's so funny is we don't even have a word for this in the English language. We, a bunch of wonks had to come up with this word. In Germany, um, in German, the, language, uh, the German language, they use the word like Mikalkeheit, I can't pronounce it right. It's basically adapted from pasteurized. It's like treated so it does not go bad in the future. <laughs> so that's even worse than ours, you know. <laughs> Like, yes, how's your marriage? It's like alcohol, you know, like, oh God, you know, like it's terrible. You pasteurize your marriage, you know, this is terrible. Um, but what I would like to figure out, and maybe some smart marketing people and branding folks could help us, we need a better word, because what I think we're intending is better than just it's okay. To, no, let's, how about we thrive? Can we have people and nature thriving together and doing so today and in the future? I think that's what we all want. How, uh, why don't we say that? But it's hard to say that in one word, and I haven't figured out how to do that yet. So the question I've been thinking about a lot, and I'm sure a lot of you have too, and I, I don't, you know, I'd love for this to be a conversation later. We can talk about other ideas to do this, but you know, how do we pull it off? How do we get to that thriving world where our future descendants look back on us and say, thank you, you left us a better world, not a degraded world. It's a world where we're thriving, and so is the natural world that we depend on. We're thriving together all because of your efforts. How do we get there? 
Well, we're launching a project at the Cal Academy that's going to try to make a dent in that. We're calling it Planet Vision. This is a shameless plug for this, uh, telling you what we're up to. But I'd love to get your feedback, because you're the first public audience we've actually presented this to. So um, it starts with a basic premise that I have not met anybody yet who hates their kids. Not one. I haven't met anyone. They might some days. I get that. Believe me. I have two teenage daughters. I understand. But I think we all want a better world for our kids or you know, the next generation if we don't have our own kids. We, we want the world to be better for the future. I don't care if you voted for Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton or if you're from a big city or small town, red state, blue. We all have this baked into our DNA. It's something about human nature that, yeah, maybe we want to leave the world as a good place. We share that in common, don't we? I think we all do, I'm pretty sure. So what the hell is stopping us from doing it? It, it, why are we doing this? If everybody I've ever met, and I bet everybody you've ever met agrees on that, then why are we doing precisely the opposite? What's stopping us? And as a scientist, I used to believe we don't have enough data. If I just publish one more peer-reviewed article in an obscure journal and put it on my CV, that's going to change the world. Yeah. Those of you who are graduate students here, no. <laughs> it won't. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but yes, we need good science, but we know a lot already, and maybe that's not the thing that's holding us back. Of course, the more we learn, the better we'll get at this, but I don't think that's what's slowing us down right now. So is it science? No. Is it technology? Well, yeah, the new you know, energy gadget, water gadget, food gadget, yeah, that would make it easier, but we have a lot of solutions right now that we're not using either, that are available today. We're not even using the technologies we have. Uh, new ones could be better, but we're not limited by this. There are certain of them sitting on the floor not being used. So let's, you know, let's move on. Is it education? I don't know. I mean, we talk about this stuff all the time. How many people have heard of the climate, you know, heard of the greenhouse effect? Okay, we've talked about it. And, you know, I could give you one more lecture on that, but I don't think it's going to help. So I think, unfortunately, we're going to keep on using the same bag of tricks. Like, if we just do one more study, one more gadget, one more class, somehow the world gets better. I don't think so. I, I think actually what is really limiting us is culture. Uh, as a scientist and an educator, and somebody who cares about technology, it took me a long time to admit this, but I actually think it's culture. It's how we talk to each other, how we conduct ourselves, and what is the narrative in our society around our future and around sustainability. And we do that at a very unusual time. Because right now, especially here in the United States, right now, we're, we're more divided than ever. And it's really hard for us to hear each other around complex issues, especially things like the environment or climate change. It's really hard to hear each other right now. And so many of us are feeling paralyzed and freaked out. Uh, this is so bizarre. Um, two factoids, one I love and one I hate. I'll tell you the one I hate first. Turns out since we've been tracking this stuff, which I think is going back almost a century, since there have been polls in the United States, we are now more anxious and afraid than we were during the Depression, or World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Watergate, uh, Ron Contra, you know. We're more freaked out now. I have to ask why. You know, I, I think we're doing it to ourselves. I mean, are the Russian bots on Facebook really that good? I mean, I, what is going on? <laughs> You know, it, this is very strange. So, you know, this is a strange time, but more Americans feel freaked out, and antidepressant and alcohol consumption are both at all-time highs right now. That's kind of strange. So, you know, there's something kind of sick in America right now, and we need to address that. The other one, I love this statistic, though. Over 80%, over 80%, a widespread swath of Americans are united in their common belief of overwhelming numbers that we're more divided than ever. <laughs> I swear to God, that's a real statistic. I, I love that statistic. Like, what? <laughs> the vast majority of us agree we're more divided than ever. Okay, I love it. Again, what are we doing to ourselves? So um, I'm setting out lately to think about, we've got to reboot the environmental discussion. It's not working. Uh, what we're doing now is not working at all. Let's start over. Let's try some new messages to talk about the environment and how we get there, and new messengers. Let's re-scrap it all and start over. Well, what are the better messages? First and foremost, we have to stop using fear 
as a tactic to talk about the environment. People cannot handle it anymore. We're, 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 we're at peak fear. We can't handle it. We're no more. Uh, and so doing one more documentary from, uh, I don't know, a famous former politician or movie star, let's say, showing collapsing icebergs and drowning polar bears and hurricanes and firestorms is not helping us at all. It really isn't. So we need to talk more about hope. Not optimism, hope. Hope is a verb. Optimism is a noun. Optimism is like, oh, it'll all turn out okay. Hope is, no, I roll up my sleeves, I'm gonna pick up a shovel and get to work, looking the very real possibility of failure in the eye and say, bring it on. I'm gonna make the world better, at least, or die trying. That's what I think hope is, and that's what we need. People to roll up their sleeves and be directed towards a better vision of a better self and a better world. Not fear, fear doesn't help us right now. We also need to stop doing stuff like this. Um, this was a very popular article in New York Magazine a little while ago. Uh, and look at the art they selected. You know, this is unbelievable. And this author took, you know, one in a million kind of remote possible scenarios, like if the very worst climate scenario combined with the very worst famine scenario combined with the very worst water scenario and disease scenario all happened at the same time, let's write an article about it and scare the hell out of everybody. It did, and it didn't help anybody. So we, you know, this is really, really wrong. We just can't do this anymore. So let's stop using fear to just get ratings and get hits on a website. Now, environmental groups, I'm gonna hit them hardest because they love this kind of stuff. Because when you put this kind of stuff out, it activates your base, your donors and your activists show up. But the problem is that's only 5% of the country. And you irritated probably about 10% on the other end of the spectrum who listened to Rush Limbaugh and you acted, for every person you activated, you activated two opponents. And that isn't helping anybody. And they're shouting at each other on Twitter and on cable news. Meanwhile, about 80% of us are sitting in the middle, scared out of our minds, hiding under our desk, hoping you'll all go away. And that's not very healthy. So we need to aim at that middle part of the American kind of political discourse that is currently being ignored. And this is one way to do that. Don't do this anymore. Second thing is we get to stop talking about problems You've all heard about climate change, but why don't we tell you about the solutions? What can we do about it? Or about you know, sustainable agriculture or better water systems or whatever. Let's focus on solutions, not just the problems. One of the best examples of this is this great book here by Paul Hawken from Marin County. Um, is, he, is he here today? <laughs> no, he might show up. I don't, I'm, Paul just shows up at stuff. He's cool. Uh, you guys know Paul, I'm sure. Um, this book is number six on the New York Times bestseller list right now. Can you believe that? It's the best uh, performing environmental book in over 30 years. And when I talked to Paul about this, he said, this is definitely not my best book. He's written other books <laughs> that, you know, he, he says, that in terms of the writing and editing, he said, this is not my best writing. But the reason this is doing so well is people are desperate to hear about solutions and to feel like there's something hopeful and solutions oriented in the world, especially right now. So he's getting a nice boost out of this from this book, I think, which is kind of cool. Um, well, incidentally, the next version of the book, I'm gonna be writing the forward, which is pretty cool. I'm really excited about that. Um, yeah, no, 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 it's cool. But um, uh, Prince Charles is writing the introduction. No, I'm writing, he's writing the forward, I'm writing the introduction, I can't remember which, but I was really honored when Paul asked me to do that. Oh, that's cool. So, um, I don't know why you mentioned that, but, it's, but I noticed the rating, when that happens, the New York Times rankings will go way down all of a sudden. <laughs> so watch for this book to disappear from the shelves, it'll never be seen again. Um, the last thing is we have to focus a lot more also on collaboration instead of unnecessary conflict. Uh, I think most of data show again and again and again, people are sick and tired of b people on cable and Twitter yelling at each other from the ends of the you know, extremes in our political discourse. And we need something more in the middle and show collaboration. For example, like Georgetown, Texas, a deeply Republican town in the heart of Texas, was the first town in America to be 100% renewably powered by wind and solar energy because it just made sense to them. I want to hear more stories like like that, or collaborations between policymakers and business and communities and individuals and NGOs when they work together to solve a problem. And when people do that, they realize like, hey, wait a, you know, wait a minute, when I'm tackling climate change, I'm joining Michael Bloomberg, a Republican, and Arnold Schwarzenegger, a Republican, and uh, Elon Musk, and Pope Francis, like, whoa, hey, that's a team I think I want to be on, you know, <laughs> that's the all-star team, I want to be on that team. And so when you stop kind of consciously, deliberately dividing us, I think you can bring a lot more people on board. So those are the better messages. Hope, not fear. Solutions, not problems. Collaboration, not conflict. 
And if you reframe all those environmental messages those ways, they get through to people so much easier. The other thing is we need better messengers, uh, not politically divisive characters, not people people have already made up their minds about, for good or bad. Uh, again, so Al Gore, love him, but it's not very helpful right now. Even Leonardo DiCaprio, people love him, but they don't trust him. Uh, Bruce Springsteen, that would work, but Leo, not so much, you know, at least in the middle of America. So, you know, we gotta, gotta kind of rethink our messengers. But one, this is, and again, a blatant pitch, is it turns out museums are really good messengers. Um, this is my museum, the Cal Academy, some of you have probably been there. Uh, if you haven't, I hope you come. Um, but this is pretty cool. But museums turn out to be a very good messenger for this. And I didn't know that until I started to run one uh, because of three things. One is museums are huge. Almost a billion people will walk into American museums this year. Almost a billion. Far more than all of the sports stadiums and theme parks in the country combined. Okay? So when you're bigger than Disney and NASCAR, well, I don't know why you're clapping, really. Um, <laughs> but it, it is hopeful that, wow, a lot of people go to museums. Um, that's really interesting when you consider our population is only 310 million or so, but a billion museum visits. So either all of us go three times or a lot of tourists come or some of you go a lot. Um, so about a quarter of those are science and natural history type centers in places like the Cal Academy or the Field Museum or the American Museum, whatever. So they're huge. And on average, people spend about four or five hours there. Just amazing. So that's really huge. The second is, and this is astonishing, is museums are, I used to say, the most trusted institutions in America. Today, I would probably have to say they're the only trusted institutions <laughs> in America because we get about an 80 to 90% approval rating from Republicans and Democrats with no difference between them. Nothing gets that. Not academia, not business, not most NGOs, not the military, not the church not the police, not the, nobody, nothing left gets that. But cultural institutions, especially museums, because we're not corporate, we're not government, and we're locally run, and we don't have a partisan agenda or don't appear to, we're trusted, at least for now. So that's pretty cool, we're big and we're trusted, and it turns out that uh, museums actually do more science education than all of the universities in the country combined, and more than all the K-12 schools in the country combined, if you look at lifelong learning. In fact, um, by age 40, Americans are among the most scientifically literate people on earth. But when we're kids, we're at the bottom of the industrialized countries. Did you know that? We always talk about, oh, science education in America is terrible. I'm like, yeah, for our kids. Our K-12 system is the worst in the world, but our colleges and universities are the best, and our informal science education are the best. So by the time we're adults, we actually rank up near Japan and South Korea in terms of scientific literacy of 40-year-olds and 50-year-olds, but not 10 to 20-year-olds. So we do a pretty good job there. Not enough, we gotta do more. But we gotta work on our youth. But it turns out museums do more science education for lifelong learning than anybody, which is pretty interesting. So here's the idea. Use new messages and new messengers. Maybe we can tip the needle a little bit and make a difference. So let's see if we can do that. So that's why we're launching this project. I'm calling it yeah, Planet Vision. The idea is we're gonna present a hopeful, actionable vision towards a sustainable world where people and nature can thrive together. It's gonna be launched on museum floors starting at the Cal Academy early in the year, but later we're gonna give it to every museum in the country, kind of like Seafood Watch is now run through every aquarium in the country, but curated at Monterey Bay. We're gonna follow the same kind of model. It's also gonna be in a large social media campaign. The Cal Academy, we have the largest social media presence of any uh, science museum, aquarium, or zoo in the world, and we're gonna leverage that. Uh, also gonna be a large multimedia hub and even a book. And we're, we think we could reach well over 200 million people a year very easily with this uh, globally. So that, that's pretty good. We're pretty excited about that. Uh, we're gonna focus on three big problems, food, water, and energy, and focus on solutions to each of these. And we're gonna do it based on real science. So like in food, we're gonna look at the, you know, the landscape of all the reviews ever done on the food system. Turns out before I came to the Cal Academy, I did those. Uh, these are three articles I wrote. Um, despite that, it's still good stuff. Um, <laughs> but we look for other people who did this in food and water and energy and did a kind of a scientific consensus of if you had to pick five things to do to the food system, the energy system, and the water system to fix them, what would they be? And we asked hundreds of leading academics and kind of looked at all the science and mapped it into these solution spaces. So like for food, for example, these are the five things that scientists say we have to do. 
We have to stop deforestation. We have to help uh, small farmers in developing countries improve their yields, but with appropriate technology, not GMOs and things that don't help them. Uh, we have to increase the efficiency of water and nutrients. We, at the consumer end, have to change our diets. Not as much meat, not as much other stuff. And food waste turns out to be the biggest lever of all. And then we can show how those solutions map into what we can do as individuals. You and I can help reduce food waste and change our diets. But I don't know many of us who can change deforestation in Indonesia directly. Maybe some of us can. But businesses and policymakers can. So if we can look at the solutions matrix of here's what the science says we must do and the numbers check out, here's what we can do at the community level, the business levels, and it, from policymaking from local all the way to international. This is a, a huge simplification of all the details. But it shows that, you know, again, through collaborating at all levels, you and me, all the way to Elon Musk, all the way to you know, the UN, we're all on the same team, and this is how we're working together. Uh, too many of these, like, you know, here's what you should do for the environment stuff, never show, first of all, is it based on science? And second of all, how does this connect to what business and policymakers need to do, too? Here, we're making it complete, transparent. It'll be a kit for individuals, but others looking at businesses and others looking at policy instruments, all connected together, all starting with science. We've done the same thing with water, same thing with energy. This is not the interesting part. This is the part where we then communicate it through museum exhibits and social media and other kinds of things. A lot of what we're going to focus on in our public-facing areas, of course, is like, what can I do at the individual level, but showcasing that, of course, you're part of a team that includes businesses and policymakers too, but you're helping them out. Uh, I'll just show you some examples of this for food. The three things we're going to focus on first and foremost are food waste. That's by far the most impactful thing we could tackle, way more important than anything else we could do for the environment period is food waste. Number two would be to eat less meat and dairy products, a lot less. But you don't have to be vegan, but wouldn't hurt. And then last but not least is, you know, try to support sustainable farms and fisheries, although there's no silver bullet. Organic versus conventional, there are pros and cons to both. Grass-fed beef, well, better would be no beef at all, but some beef grass-fed is okay, but not for climate change, but it's good for water and good for habitat. And Seafood Watch is good about fisheries, but this is a little more murky than you might like to believe. Um, but, you know, we can make some efforts there, but mainly food waste and diets, that's really huge. Water, when you get to your homes, really start in your yards. Landscaping is the biggest use of water in our homes by far. And then, of course, leaky toilets, showers, so garden hoses are the next biggest user of water, and then the appliances like shower heads and toilets and all that kind of stuff. And energy, of course, you know, there's so many different types of energy we use, whether it's electricity, we talk about all that stuff, of course, and transport, and of course, uh, heating and cooling, which is, you know, a big part of this right here, too. But another thing, and I, I'm sure somebody will ask me if I didn't mention it, we can't just fix the food, energy, and water systems of our planet without also thinking about how did they get that way in the first place? So we also have to look at the mirror and change ourselves a little bit. And especially the two forces that are shaping our time, our consumer throwaway culture and population are both culprits here. So we're gonna gently talk about this. Um, these are provocative third rail issues. Uh, but one is, you know, think, do you really need that new thing? Or if so, did you think about how it's made and how it's operated? And, you know, do we really need single use throwaway stuff so much, like straws and, do we really need that? You know, can we come up with something better, for example? Uh, or in, you know, think before you throw it away. Can it be used again? Can it be recycled? And so on. We've all heard about this stuff, but we really do need to be more thoughtful about this. And I'm sure uh, in this group, people will ask this question too. We'll talk about it later. But uh, we are going to mention population because it's just math. More people means more use of resources overall. But uh, we in the rich countries of the world, we're the biggest culprits. Uh, you know, one of us has as much impact as 100 people from Bangladesh. So, you know, our population growth is actually far more important than in developing countries. And, of course, you know, we need to talk about this in a way that can be used. So, in developing countries, we're really talking about women's empowerment and education being the key here. Not formal, you know, population control, that's never going to work. But helping young women realize their potential, and as a nice side effect of that, they tend to have smaller families uh, later in their lives and helps so many other things, the so-called girl effect. So we're going to talk about those issues as well, and we're going to try to figure that all out. We're going to launch this in January, uh, starting at the Cal Academy, January 26. But if you'd like to kind of get ahead of the curve, you can go here and sign up with your email address, just planetvision.com, and uh, we'll be sure to email you, know, email you updates on this as we go along and let you know about the announcement of this. But I think it's going to be pretty exciting. 
Uh, last, and then I'd love to open it up to discussion because I know this would be a very thought, um, thoughtful group and a lot of provocative discussion. Um, we're facing the challenge not only of our time, but all time. We basically have to reinvent civilization and we have to do it within less than a human generation. Otherwise, there won't be very many more after us, period. We, we don't have to argue about that. We know that's true. We know it in our bones. We just don't, there's denial from a lot of people who don't really want to acknowledge that and they're muddying up the waters, but we all know it's true. Can we just move on and solve them? Because I'm actually convinced we can. This is the problem of our time, but you know, it's also gonna be working with future generations. We have to become better ancestors. Uh, every, I don't know, I think about the old American dream a lot. Uh, my great-great-grandfather, who I was named after, moved here from Ireland. He was a bricklayer who died at the age of 32, and he had nine children when he died. Irish Catholic, big families, you know, and uh, out of New England. And um, the, only, the one of those nine children, the youngest was a son, the rest were daughters. He quit school at the age of eight and basically worked every day of his life ever since to uh, provide for his family. You know, he devoted himself to his generation but all the generations that came after him. That's the American dream that I remember. Work hard, build your community, help your family, and think about your children that they live better lives than you did. Somehow we lost that along the way. This intergenerational compact that, you know what, the next generation should be better than ours. They should have it better than us. When did we lose that? Well, we've lost it so many times, but I think there are glimmers of this in our past. This is what I love. I just want to mention this example of people who really thought long-term about future generations. This is the new college at Oxford University. Uh, this was built in 1386. So you think you have old buildings, President Wong. You know, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is a rather old building from the 14th century. And it turns out, if you've ever been in the dining hall of the new, this is a residential college, kind of like a big dorm and learning hall. If you go in the dining hall, it looks like it's out of Hogwarts from Harry Potter. You go in and these giant beams in the ceiling, big high tall ceilings, beautiful windows. But it turns out up at the top, these giant oak beams were rotting in the last century. And they had to replace them. So the story goes that they went and looked at them like, wow, how are we gonna replace those big oak beams? Well, they were gonna tear them out and replace them with steel beams and then uh, cover them with an oak veneer to make it look like an old ancient oak tree. And somebody's like, well, how will we make it look realistic like an ancient tree? And somebody raised their hand and said, well, we could write to the university forester. It turns out Oxford hired some guy way out in the woods of England somewhere to run a forest, you know, hundreds of miles away. And they never talked to this person, but they've been there a long time, I guess. And let's write to that person and ask them how to make a beam that looks like a tree and an ancient tree. So they write to this guy. He writes back and says, steel beams, veneer, what are you talking about? Your trees are ready now. <laughs> they write back to him like, what the hell are you talking about? And he says, well, in the 14th century, my predecessors, knew that you probably need some new beams about the 20th century, and they take about 600 years to grow, you see. So we've been waiting for you, and <laughs> your order is now fulfilled. You know, it's, it's kind of like the opposite of Amazon Prime. <laughs> it's like, it's Amazon Millennium. Um, you can sign up now and your ancestor, your descendants will get the, the goods you ordered from 600 years from now. They literally planted trees and said, don't cut those down. That's for the, the dining hall of the new college. And they told, seriously, they told generation after generation of foresters, don't cut those down. That's for the new college. And in the 20th century, they harvested them. Now what nobody seems to have the answer to, and I can't get to the bottom of it, did they plant trees again for the 26th century? I hope so. Uh, if so, and you know, this building doesn't have a LEED certification, but this might be the, the, you know, when you plant the replacement parts of your building for a thousand years into the future, that's pretty amazing. We should do more of that. So when I used to teach freshmen, I would tell stories like this, and I'd talk about children and future generations, but you're talking to a bunch of 18-year-olds sometimes, and it's really hard to talk to 18-year-olds, at least most of them, about future generations, because they're barely a generation into themselves at that age, right? We're just getting started as an adult. So I would do this trick instead. I'd say, we're gonna be working with people like this, people from Sydney and Rio and Santiago and Amsterdam and Hong Kong, and I had hundreds of these photos. And uh, they're like, wow, you know what they would ask? They're like, is she on Tinder? She's kind of hot, you know, or <laughs> that, guy, that guy's really cute. Is he on Facebook or can you introduce me? And I'm like, I'd laugh and say, well, actually, none of these people exist. 
Uh, this is a project called thefaceoftomorrow.com where uh, a photographer would go to these cities and take pictures of hundreds of ordinary folks in the street and then digitally superimpose all the photos and pulled out the emergent face from the crowd. So this is literally what the future of humanity might look like. Probably in the future we're all gonna be really good looking or something, I <laughs> don't know, maybe that's good. But I look at that and I, I tell my students in the past, like these are your clients, these are the people we work for every day, people you will never meet and that's the most honorable job of all. And so with that, I just wanna leave you one last thought. I mentioned the power of hope. Um, you know, I've tried very hard to, as a scientist, you know, articulate it's really about our humanity more than it is about some technical fix or some policy instrument or some new economic tool. It's really about who we are in our hearts that'll determine the future more than anything. So I wanna leave you with a quote that's far better written than anything I could write from Barbara Kingsolver. Uh, she wrote this in a book called Animal Dreams. She once wrote, Here's what I've decided. The very least you can do in your life is figure out what you hope for. What I want is so simple I almost can't say it. Elementary kindness, enough to eat, enough to go around, and the possibility that one day children will be neither the destroyers nor the destroyed. And that's about it. So thank you and I uh, look forward to this conversation and uh, contact tonight, so thank you. So I believe we have uh, roaming microphones. We do. Well, so what we're going to... Oh, wait. We have on. the... Hold on. But wait, there's more. Hold on. Oh, this is active. Good. So um, in the spirit of talking about hope and the next generation, we're going to have some of our students come up and interview John. Uh, he's, they've uh, been very interested in his work, and I'd like to introduce to two of our master's students, um, Max Sapansky and Kelly Santos. Say hello, everyone. <laughs> so this is kind of Commonwealth Club style, if you will. We do uh, some interviews with the students, and then we're going to open up to the rest of the audience to ask questions. So you can start thinking about what you'd like to ask. Um, we've got a couple of stools over here. I'm going to pull these forward just so that it's a little easier for people. John, you ended your talk on one of my most favorite authors. I have to tell you that, oh. Barbara Kilksolver. I, she is just inspiring to me, so thank you for that. <laughs> All right, Kelly, here's your microphone. Thank you. Max, okay, that one's working too. There you go. And uh, I'll let you guys take away. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Nielsen. Um, I think Max is going to start with the questions. We really enjoyed your talk. Dr. Foley, it's fantastic and inspiring. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so Catherine Hayhoe, uh, another famous science communicator, has recommended to speak from the heart and then the head when it comes to talking about climate change. And I think that resonates with your message and focusing on hope and uh, focusing on solutions. And so I'm wondering if you think that the, science com the scientific community is changing gears when it comes to science communication, and if so, are there any particular efforts that strike you as particularly effective? Yeah, um, so Catherine Hayo is actually a, a good friend of mine. So um, if you don't know her, um, look her up. She's uh, at Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas. Um, so Catherine Hayo, uh, she's become very famous lately because she's a world-renowned climate scientist, knows a lot about climate change and her research is really cutting edge. She also, and this is not contradictory at all, despite what a lot of people think, she's also an evangelical Christian. And she grew up as a daughter of missionaries when she was a child, and uh, she's also Canadian, which makes her very, very nice. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, in addition to all that other wonderful stuff. So she's become an effective ambassador to kind of, you know, what you, um, uh, you know, unfortunately the issues of climate change, s thermometers aren't political. They don't join parties. But people have sort of captured this debate and made it partisan, and it never was until recently, it's only because it's aligned with particular business interest and disinterest that it somehow became partisan. Scientists are not overtly partisan or political kind of people. So uh, unfortunately, as you all understand, a lot of the, uh, maybe let's say the writer end of the political spectrum, the, the right side um, of you know, Republicans and conservatives, and often maybe tied to religious uh, fundamentals, 
uh, and evangelicals um, are maybe less likely to believe in the science of climate change. So she's a wonderful ambassador to do that because she talks about stewardship. She talks about you know, the Christian values of you know, leaving the world better, uh, of future generations, also of uh, addressing the needs of the poorest among us. And um, you know, a true Christian would look at that and say, yes, that makes climate change a, a moral imperative for us to address. And so she's been very effective with that, but she uses kind of emotional resonance to connect to people. And I think it's been a good lesson to the rest of the scientific community, because first, before we were ever scientists, we're human beings. And, uh, you know, and despite, I can, tell, I can show you thousands of pages of data that tell you data don't matter when communicating to people. You know, I, I can prove that with lots of data, but it doesn't matter. Because it's really about if you don't hear somebody emotionally, if you don't connect to them, you're never going to hear what they say. And in this era of kind of post-fact, now I want scientific integrity, I want the facts to be right, but I think we also have to use kind of um, language and rhetoric that is persuasive and connects to people emotionally. So find out where people live, you know, who are they? Uh, I learned that the hard way, um, or the nice way, I guess, at the, at the museum. I found that I'm, you know, in my earlier life, if I wanted to talk to a, and I grew up as a Republican, by the way, so this isn't partisan for me, but lately um, I've seen the political landscape of this country become so polarized, it became harder to talk to Republicans about climate change sometimes, at least from some parts of the country. But I find when they come to my museum, I can see a Donald Trump voter walking in with a Bernie Sanders voter through our rainforest exhibit. And they come out of the end happy, they're friends, they wanna talk to each other. What happened? They were reconnecting to something beautiful and inspiring, and they get to share it with their kids and people they love. We, so I think the, the emotional thing that Catherine Hayes was talking about is find common ground. And we all love our kids. Many of us have um, articles of faith. All of us love our communities. We want the world to be better. Find common ground emotionally and start here and you end up here. The most important space in the human body is the 18 inches between the human head and the brain stem. You know, and that's the space we start. And, um, and science communication that starts here never gets anywhere. Uh, it, it, facts matter, but emotion matters even as much or more. So I totally agree with that. And I think the scientific community is late in learning this uh, and much to our um, you know, detriment, but we're getting there. All right, well, on a different note, museums like the Cal Academy are leaders in citizen science. Mm -hmm. And in your opinion, what are the power and limitations of implementing citizen science projects? Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, citizen science, you know, science should be done by everybody. We're all kind of born as scientists a little bit as a kid, right? We're inquisitive, we want to learn more, we play with things, we tinker, we have hypotheses, even if we don't call them that, I wonder what will happen if I do this. And we do experiments and stuff, and then later they kind of beat it out of us in, in high school and college maybe, but you know, we all have a little bit of inner inquisitiveness, and so I think we all kind of are intrigued about the natural world and what works and what doesn't. So I love the idea of getting citizens engaged in science. Uh, one example we have is something called iNaturalist, which is a, a, an app that, if you don't, here's another shameless plug. Um, <laughs> This little thing called iNaturalist, which you can load onto your Android or iPhone device. And it's a tool to, uh, it'll take a photo. You can take a photo of a bird or, or any plant, any animal or any fungus in the world. And it automatically using uh, artificial intelligence image recognition with about 90% accuracy will tell you the species of what you're looking at, which is pretty awesome. And we invented that at the Academy, which is pretty cool. But what's even better, and you don't have to even know that we do this, that photo is also uploaded to a global database with the timestamp and the GPS coordinates of where the photo was taken. And so now we have a global map of about several hundred thousand species, all powered by regular folks like you and me taking pictures with our smartphones. We just collected uh, seven million observations, the last million of which came in in the last 72 days. Um, we, and we haven't announced this publicly yet, but what the hell, you're all friends, right? Um, so um, the, the camera's not on right now. Um, uh, <laughs> It's not a secret, but we just, part, um, National Geographic approached us and kind of doubled the funding for iNaturalist, and then Microsoft came to us and partnered with us as well. And we're gonna take this off into a big global observatory for nature and get tens of millions of people out there combining with what we can see from satellites, but what we can see on the ground to track in real time within one meter accuracy every form of life on Earth. That's pretty cool. Uh, that's citizen science on steroids, so yeah. So if you want to join that community of amateur scientists helping the world find out what's still here and where is it, um, join iNaturalist. It's a really thriving kind of cool community. There are many others, but I think that's actually the one I'm most excited about, not just because we happen to run it, but 
it's actually pretty cool. There are many others, but that's where citizen science can be very, very helpful. Would you mind touching on how we can overcome limitations of citizen science too? Um, well, I think a lot of efforts are successful, some aren't. Um, I'm not sure there's a really common pattern here yet. Um, I think sometimes we have to do a lot more listening uh, and ask like, what would really engage people in wanting to be part of that community? Because it's not just some uniform block. Uh, iNaturalist first started out with like nature enthusiasts. You know how like, there are a lot of amateur, you know, they're like bird watching folks who are really passionate about birds. Turns out there are people like that for everything. So there are birders, there are newt people, there, I swear to God, there, I'm, I've, I, I happen to know some. Uh, there's nudibranch, I didn't know what a nudibranch was until I moved here, it was like sea slugs. We don't have them in Maine. We, where I grew up, there, we had sand dollar. We didn't have nudibranchs around. Like, but they're all over. The, so they're like nudib. Like, what the heck? You know, really? And you know, so um, also people track ferns for a hobby. And so, so those people we love. But then when we turned it onto a photo recognition software for iNaturalist, suddenly a lot of just regular folks said, "I don't really want to count 500 birds in my life, but I just want to know if that's a woodpecker or not." <laughs> you know, and that crowd. Then we kind of spoke to their need, and suddenly it became a lot more powerful. So yeah, just gonna meet people where they are and not where the science uh, thinks it is. We have to really listen a lot more to our constituents. Thanks. Yeah. Should we keep asking questions or open up to the floor? Yeah. All right. Uh, so in the last few months, you've been particularly vocal about <laughs> uh, science censorship. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could uh, speak to what are <clears throat> the consequences of that that worry you the most and what are some safeguards that you find or that you think will be essential? Yeah, um, so there's, there's, I think it's fairly obvious right now that science, independent science, is under attack in America right now. And not every form of science, know what they're going after, is science related to the environment, to public health, to your safety and mine. The Defense Department, they're not cutting that. Or, you know, uh, weapons technology or stuff that's used in industry. It's about the environment. It's about health. It's about safety. It's about our kids. It's about reproductive rights. It's about birth control. Things like that with a very clear partisan, political, and money objective behind it. It's, it's super clear what's going on here. And we can't even pretend that it's not happening, okay? Uh, this is dangerous for democracy. When politicians with an agenda, with money behind that agenda, obviously, too, start interfering with the uh, conduct of science, especially science done in the public interest, when EPA scientists are no longer allowed to go to conferences and present their results, when scientists from the US Forest Service aren't allowed to go to conferences and talk about fires and the possible links between climate change and the risk of catastrophic fire. That is not the democracy we want. I don't care whether you're Republican or Democrat, or this is not cool. Um, and this could go either way in terms of the political divide. If Democrats were doing it, I'd be just as outspoken as it is today. And we've just never seen anything like this. So what we're seeing is basically several simultaneous attacks. One is we call the merchants of doubt. If you can't defeat science with facts, you throw dust in the air. Say, so, well, I'm not a scientist, but I read somewhere that you talked about global cooling back in the 70s. Yeah, one cranky guy back in the 70s did, and he's the same guy who's saying it today. And he was wrong then, and he's wrong now. Everybody else has been talking about warming since the 1830s, by the way. Uh, literally the 1830s. So, you know, that, that just cows doubt. Let's just throw a little bit of confusion in the air. If you can't actually win in the facts, create confusion. That's one of them. Second is intimidate the scientists who are out there. So we mentioned Catherine Hayhoe earlier. Um, she receives death threats on a daily basis. Oh yeah, I do, well not daily, I get some, about every month or two I get some. Um, not nearly as bad. Women seem to get a lot worse than men too, which is a horrible other problem we have today. Uh, this is unbelievable. Like scientists who just said, you know what, I just wanna do research and I wanna give my research away to the world to try to make it a little bit better. And you get death threats. I remember one she got was, I hope your son sees your severed head in the basket after we, you know, after we take you to the guillotine. You know, this, and her son's like nine years old. She has to live in hiding. She can't actually have her office in the same building as the rest of her department. And she lives in basically an undisclosed location. It's almost like she's in a witness protection program. Uh, this is America in the 21st century. I mean, really. Uh, so this is just dangerous. It's bad for democracy. It's bad for public safety. It's bad for our environment. It's bad for health. It's bad for everything. And if you can't trust our own government to tell us what science is saying, and science is fallible. 
we do make mistakes, but that's the beauty of science. It recognizes its own mistakes and moves on and tries to give you the most honest, clearest picture the data allow. If politicians start interfering with that, it undermines 50 years of scientific investment that we've made in this country to make us a global leader. So this is just dangerous. And if you don't think that facts matter and science doesn't matter, what's next? Laws? I mean, you know, what, how much more erosion of democracy can we stand? So and this, is, this is, obviously, I'm very passionate about this. Um, the Academy, we, we've actually been pretty outspoken in our, our community among museums. We're probably the most outspoken, well, not probably, we are the most outspoken museum on this. Because, um, well, fortunately, I think in the Bay Area, I think we have supporters who recognize this. And two, I don't care if I get fired over that. I really don't. Uh, so I'm being vocal, even if I go out ahead of the Academy sometimes, I'm just gonna do it. And it's not about partisan politics, it's just right and wrong. And <laughs> period. <laughs> And, um, and today, I think we have a special compact, a covenant with the world that if science doesn't stand up for the public good, what are we doing? You know, we, we should do good science, but I wanna make sure science does good in the world. And that's our duty. And that's what we're asking for is don't support science. Support science so we can in turn support you. That's all we're asking. So towards the end of your presentation, you touched on this, but mm -hmm. I was wondering if you can give some specific examples of what steps we as individuals can take to help foster a more sustainable and equitable world. Yeah, so the, the take home message I would say to you is re, uh, look at food, water, and energy. Um, a lot of other things matter too, but those are the three biggies. That's like 90% of our global environmental issues always trace back to those three things. Sure, there are other issues, but those are the three big ones. Uh, and food, uh, you know, we love to talk about local than organic and this and that. It turns out food waste is 10 times more important when you run the numbers. So no matter what food you eat, don't waste it if you don't have to. So that's number one. Um, there are a couple of good examples about how to do that. For example, uh, you're a part of a university system. When I was, I used to be a professor at the University of Minnesota and a dean there basically, and, um, or director of a large institute. And we, uh, we did something once that was pretty amazing. We got rid of cafeteria trays in the cafeteria because we we're on all, we, we had 55,000 students. Um, how many does San Francisco State have? Probably more, right? 30, 30 okay. So we're both, they're both the size of a small city almost, huge universities, right? Uh, when we got rid of cafeteria trays, it was to save hot water. We were like, oh, it was, it was an energy move to not have to wash all the trays. But then suddenly food waste dropped by 80%. We're like, what? And it more than paid for itself like that by not having to haul away all those garbage cans full of organic waste. Because you give an average 18-year-old a tray, and it's like, all you can eat, boom, you know. And um, you remember the freshman 15, you've heard about that, you know, like, well, people just put, you know, my mom used to call it, your eyes are bigger than your stomach. And you put all this food on there, but if you can just carry, you know, you carry a bowl of cereal and a glass of milk or whatever for breakfast, you can go get more if you feel like it. You often don't, and you eat what you need. And it turned out it was a simple little thing. At the Cal Academy, we have two restaurants. We have one for humans that serves about a million meals a year. So we have about one and a half million visitors. Uh, so we serve a million human meals a year, but then every day we have 40,000 other animals we have to feed, including fish and sharks and alligators and snakes and butterflies and all the rest. And uh, they're separate institutions. You know, there's one downstairs for the fish, one upstairs for the people. Uh, turns out, though, they order some of the same food. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, turns out our, our fish and insects and lizards and stuff really like local organic produce. That It has to be organic. It must be, because we're feeding them to insects. If any of our you know, fruits and vegetables are sprayed with insecticide, that's bad, really, really bad you know, for insects to have you know, poison fed to them. So we, we order from like a lot of farmers in like Sonoma, Marin, Napa, and they come down with a truck and deliver it. So one day, the foods for the bugs and the uh, fish came and it went to the wrong place. It went to the human restaurant. <laughs> and we're like, oh, that's funny. That's the same stuff we ordered, but it's addressed to the aquarium. So they call the aquarium, like, hey, dude, your food's up here, but I think it's a mix-up. So they came up, like, hey, that's funny. You're ordering apples and bananas and the same stuff we are, whatever it was, I can't remember. And they're like, hey, you know what? First of all, we should order together so the farmers you know, can save a trip, saves energy and fuel and time, and we might get a better price, win-win. And they're like, oh, that's great. So the aquarium guys are hauling it off and taking it downstairs, and one of them looks around and says, hey, wait a minute. 
what do you do when you have a bad banana? They're like, what do you mean? You know, let's say a banana with a bruise on it or apple with a worm in it or something. What do you do with this? As well, we can't sell it, so we put it in the compost and that goes to San Francisco composting. It's used in marine. It's like, uh-uh, uh give it to me. My fish love that stuff. Like the worm, that's a bonus. You know, that's good. <laughs> And so they looked at each other like, oh my God. You know, so we started diverting the food waste from the human cafeteria, at least some of it, into the aquarium. Then we got on the phone and called 100 other aquariums and said, hey, are you doing this? Not one of them had thought of it. It's just one guy named Jake who figured this out. He has a high school degree. He's not a sustainability expert. He just said, what do you do with a bad banana? And he saved tons of food waste, literally. So th those are things you can do not only at the home level, but institutional level as well. There are all sorts of interesting things we haven't even thought of. And those all are big wins. Anyway, there are many more like that, but I think there's probably more questions. So we're going to open it up to the audience. So thank you, Max <coughs> and Kelly. Thank you very much. I'm going to. I'm going to introduce two new, two additional students. These are first-year students in our master's program, Byron Rickens and Chrissy Edmonton, and they're going to uh, help you with microphones. So if you have questions, please raise your hand and let's come on over. So the first question I have is about the Bioshock Institute. First of all, let me say that was a fantastic lecture. Uh, I, uh, I put on lots of lectures for the uh, Bay Institute. Uh -huh. We have 59 of them so far. You came and uh, we all had a nice discussion about it yeah, yeah. and so forth. I, as I mentioned, I, I, I enjoyed your comments, enjoy them, but your comments about what's happening with uh, scientific integrity yeah. uh, in, in Washington right now. And I just thought I would just mention this, that yesterday, Administrator Pruitt from uh, <laughs> EPA issued a directive to ensure independence, geographic diversity, diversity and integrity for EPA science committees. So these are committees that are made up of all sorts of science experts, all sorts of members of the community. Mm -hmm. I, I chair the National MPA uh, Advisory uh, Committee, and there are people from all over the place on this committee. Well, what this directive says is if you are the recipient of any EPA funding of any kind at any level, you are no longer allowed to be on one of these committees. Well, lo and behold, about the vast majority of the research community does not get their money from Chevron USA but they do get the money from government grants. Mm -hmm. So what this does is it effectively eviscerates a ton of scientific uh, input into these committees. I mean, this is really, really disgusting. It says nothing about whether you're regulated by the US EPA. So you could be a, someone who is regulated and stands to lose a hell of a lot with these decisions. But if you are a researcher funded through these federal grants, you're no longer in. Just thought I'd ask your comment on that. Yeah, um, that's a really, I mean, um, as completely incompetent as this administration seems to be, the EPA, unfortunately, is not. Um, it, it's a very competent, but going in the wrong direction. And they're doing stuff like that. And, you know, at first that sounds kind of reasonable, like, oh, wait a minute, maybe people who receive EPA funding shouldn't advise EPA on how they spend their money. You know, on the surface, it sounds pretty reasonable, but on the other, I'm like, yeah, but this is independent science that's awarded through peer review, and what is not a conflict of interest is if you're a major petrochemical company regulated by the EPA, your experts are just fine. Yeah. Like, excuse me, there are billions of dollars at stake there, but a scientist from, you know, from, you know, the uh, Bay Institute or something isn't allowed to talk about fisheries because 20 years ago, you get an EPA grant, you're like, what? That's crazy. Yeah, so it's really, really bizarre, and they didn't even include, like, you could have international science. If that were truly a conflict of interest, you know, it would have shown up already, it's not. Even Christy Todd Whitman and others say this is nonsense. So yeah, it's, it's very, very strange what's going on here. Uh, I think we have to be very, very careful. Um, and this is just one of many things. Uh, the EPA in particular and Department of Interior have been extremely odd in their management of scientific integrity lately. Um, well, it's not odd, we know what they're doing. I mean, it's pretty obvious. They, they're just trying to put a little bow around it, but you know, it's pretty transparent. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks for mentioning that. That's good. So there's a question over uh, here. Yes. Yes, you mentioned death threats to scientists, mm -hmm. and the previous generations of scientists <clears throat> have um, experienced something similar, like yeah. Newton and Galileo and Darwin. So yeah. what can we learn, or what have we learned, and we're putting into practice now to <coughs> advance um, the, the, uh, the uh, recognition of global warming as a, as a threat in terms of what they experienced before and how they overcame those challenges? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I'm not sure how to answer that. It's, it's just, I mean, 
um, pretty much every scientist I've ever met who is, uh, gets out of the ivory tower and talks about either you know, climate change, for example, or other kind of hot button issues, uh, today will receive uh, either uh, death wishes or death threats. I mean, you have to kind of you know, stratify those. One was, I hope you die. The other is, I know where you live kind of stuff. So you have to take them a little differently. Um, and whether they you know, try to you know, threaten your family or something, that's where you know, like it's really interesting and awful. Um, so yeah, it's, I don't know, pretty much all of my friends who do this kind of stuff say that's part of their lives. Some of them actually do have to hire security and, you know, not publish where they live and be very, very careful about that kind of stuff. Um, that's just tragic. I don't really understand that. Uh, and these are, again, are just ordinary folks who thought meteorology was interesting as a kid <laughs> and wanted to just serve them. I mean, like, if you met the woman Catherine Hayo we're talking about, she's like the nicest person ever. She's, a, you know, she grew up as a missionary's kid. She's Canadian. She likes hockey, you know. <laughs> she's sweet and charming. And if you got to know her, you'd be like, oh my God, that's like my kid's sister. How the hell could anybody threaten her life? And why? Uh, but this is how sick we've become. And almost all of them are these cowards on Twitter hiding behind anonymous bots or fictional personas who if you met them in the street, you know, they'd be cowering in their boots, I bet. These are just... You know, so I, I don't know whether you take those very seriously or it's just a symptom of a sick society. But we, we should be better people than that. I, I just, I don't know what's wrong with us. Uh, so I don't have an answer, but it's, it's an observation that we just have to deal with it and get up and do it again tomorrow. And um, fortunately, you know, there's a lot of good things that happen too. There are also a lot of people who cheer you on and stand up for you. And I think that's what we need to do. I would love for all Americans to recognize scientists <laughs> I and mean, it's not meant to sound self-serving, but you know, there's a lot of people who are scientists who just want to give to their communities, who were brought up believing that facts matter, integrity matters, honesty matters, and that serving, you know, they, they heard the call of Kennedy. Like, you know, don't ask what America could do for you, ask what you can do for America. And I think there are generations who follow that ideal. Uh, and it's so sad to have now a chief executive who doesn't ask that of us, but brings out the worst in us sometimes, and others, not just him. But um, I, I think we need to support people who still believe in serving humanity and serving the public good. And there's so many of them in this room today and in our public universities and places like San Francisco State, as well as the UC system and others. These are heroes. These are people who could have made a lot more money doing something else, but instead they're teaching our kids, they're giving away their knowledge for free and trying to make the world a little bit better. Let's make sure we support them and have their backs. That's what I'd like to see. Uh, I think it's, we're going to... The next question is coming from, speaking of the next generation, we have uh, students at San Francisco State, I believe, watching the program. There's a question from Aaron Yeah, there is. Or, oh. Oh, it's coming in on uh, Snapchat yeah, or something? This, this is on the live stream. So yeah. if there's people watching yeah. on the live stream at San Francisco State. And Hi, <laughs> yeah. They're actually asking you to repeat the questions as well. Oh, not, yeah, right, of course. They're not hearing the questions. Yeah, yeah, well. So their question is, um, <clears throat> we want to know about your thoughts on energy solutions. What mm -hmm. are the big areas we should f be focusing on at the residential, industrial, and global levels? Uh, okay, well, hopefully they heard that, but if they didn't, um, it's about energy solutions. What are some of the key energy solutions we should be focusing on? Uh, there are many other folks who are deeper experts around energy than I am, but um, first and foremost, I know we, we kind of laugh at this, like from the Jimmy Carter era and stuff, but energy uh, kind of efficiency is still by far the best investment we can make. Uh, buildings are still enormously inefficient in the United States. We could be so much better about that. Vehicle efficiency is still a long way to go before we've tapped all that out. So that's always the first place to begin. Uh, while you're uh, inventing a new technology, lacing up your boots, energy efficiency has already circled the track three times. So, and you know, that's amazing. Uh, now though, um, we can do things, not only is there a revolution in solar production and the dramatic dropping of price there, but LED lighting is also dropping at even a faster price curve. So those are very, very interesting. So um, on energy efficiency, always, always, always start there. It pays for itself immediately. Then, and only then, would you then switch towards those renewable sources like wind, solar, hydro, and so on. Uh, those are amazingly cost-effective today. They're cheaper than 
coal, far cheaper than nuclear. Nuclear is dying because it's too expensive uh, and nobody will insure it and nobody will underwrite it and Wall Street won't invest in it. It might be a perfectly good engineering technology and I know there'll be people in this room who argue with me about that, but financially it's a disaster and it's just dead, move on, solar and wind. And yes, we can store solar energy and we can store wind. Batteries are getting cheaper, pumped hydro. There are storage solutions. And there's also a lot of behavioral solutions of timing our use of energy to certain times of day. The other thing is electrify everything we can. Uh, so when you move cars and transport to electric, that means you can power them with re renewable sources, moving away from natural gas, gasoline, diesel, and other fuels that it's really unlikely I'll find carbon-free substitutes for that. So efficiency, renewables, electrify. It's kind of the three, the p three pillars of that transition, I think. Uh, but efficiency always gets kind of short shrift. It's not sexy. There's no Elon Musk for energy efficiency. There's no venture capital behind it. And this is weird because we like this sexy new space age gadget, but it turns out energy efficiency will kick the ass of any other new technology every time in terms of actually reducing emissions and making us more energy secure. So I always plug for that. Uh, start with efficiency, reduce waste, reduce waste, reduce waste. Then we can talk about the new fancy technologies. Um, where's the next question? I guess there's a mic over here. Yeah. Uh, thank you, and thank you for all your work, and actually everybody in this room, because I think everyone here is really trying to put their heart and soul into a very important mission. And I'm really glad that you raised Jimmy Carter. Yeah. This is the time to remember an era that we gloss over, and even, um, you know, with respect, mm -hmm. you know, it's not been the last 50 years. It's been the last 30 years. Yeah. And there are charts, and I've seen yeah. them, where We're ocean doing. acidification, things spike in the beginning of the 1980s. Yeah. What we're experiencing now, even as environmentalists, and many of us who have put our money, time, energy, and you know, understanding what is important to do, is exactly what Jimmy Carter had done. Yeah. Solar panels on the White House, 17,000 wind turbines, energy department, following you know, Earth Day in the 1970s, incredible work. Yeah of people in the 1970s that must not go unrecognized today. Yep. Completely because right. what we have an opportunity to do today is glean from that experience what went wrong. Because mm -hmm. we're experiencing that right now. Yeah. You know? And what went wrong was that fear, and I'm glad you raised that. Yeah. But even more importantly is to honor the people before us. And Jimmy Carter is one. Yeah. He is the father of the solar age, and no environmentalist, even today, want to admit that, yep. you know? Yep. And that man has been living it, living it, living it, and we still do not want to recognize that on a societal level. To me, that's the elephant in the room, mm -hmm. you know? And it's what we individually can learn from yep. in order to not walk that dangerous path again, because we're feeling it right now. And so I just wondered, what can we glean from your opinion from that experience to empower us today? Well, first of all, I completely agree. A lot of the things that you know, I'm talking about today, you would have, could have talked about in 1979. Um, and ironically, we did, a lot of them. Well, you know, the priorities change, and the science is different, the technology is different, but we're talking about renewable energy and conservation and water and food. And you know, this isn't radically, you, you could have been here in 1977 and had a similar conversation as we're having today. Uh, we just wouldn't be tweeting about it or something. Um, we'd actually be talking to each other. Um, so yeah, I, I totally agree with your sentiment. I think the thing to be learned is the marginalization of the environmental movement. Uh, it started in the 80s that somehow the political parties took apart. I mean, Richard Nixon was by you know, any objective measure in terms of legislation that was passed, whether he was heartfelt about it or not is not the point. But in terms of laws that were signed, Richard Nixon was the best environmental president in American history. The Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Air Act, the formation of the EPA, all happened during the Nixon administration. Uh, we had leaders like, uh, well, John McCain, uh, still to this day. Um, uh, see, John Hines, Lindsey Graham, Olympia Snow, um, Bill, uh, Bill Cohen, uh, a number of Republican leaders who are some of the staunchest uh, advocates for environmental work. I think that started to bifurcate in the 1980s when environmental movement was associated with more liberal, socially liberal causes and maybe became more the pet of the Democratic Party. And the, you know, so that's, I think, where that divide began. And I think Reagan versus uh, Carter kind of exemplify that world divide of we don't need to, you know, the people make fun of Jimmy Carter in the cardigan sweaters and turning down your thermostat where Reagan says, no, we're, we're Americans, drive your pickups and we'll beat the Russians or whatever. I'm simplifying, but you know what I mean? Yeah. 
And that was part of his brand. And so I think that environmental movement, we kind of went off the rails and we need to get back on them again. So it's not about that stuff. It's about everybody's kids. It's about a better world and making the economy stronger, making us more secure and safer. Uh, so this is where I kind of take tasks with the environmental communities. I think we've aligned it, those environmental ideals with social ideals that aren't uniformly shared among uh, all Americans. We need to resonate with all Americans and find common uh, emotional cores, which we love our kids. We want to be healthy. We want America to be strong and secure, and we would like to be prosperous. Environmental solutions are the core foundation to all of those things. And once you realize that, it's no longer a partisan issue. And so I think, I think you're right, but I also think that's kind of where the fork in the road began when the environmental community maybe lost its way a little bit in some ways. Um, and then we need to bring that back in a new frame. This is my personal. Oh, yeah. Still alive. Yes, yes. Making 93 years old. Building One houses. One month ago. Yep. Uh, so another question. I don't know where the mic is. Uh, I guess there's some. I'm not selecting the questions. The microphone rovers are, so don't, you know. Yes. Hi, John. I appreciate your talk tonight. Thanks. Um, on the solution side, I wonder if Planet uh, Vision has uh -huh. considered computer games. There's a genre of computer games called simulations yep. or strategy games, yep, yep, yep. which have huge followings. Yep. And in fact, I, could, I think a whole generation of urban planners grew up playing SimCity. Sim oh, yeah, and SimEarth used to be Sim there. SimEarth, right? Yeah, yeah, there was one. Um, I'm picturing a, a civilization game, the new version, which would where people would have to figure out how to balance yep. resources, et cetera, to win the game. Yep. And raise a whole generation of people that are like passionate about this subject, so. Yeah, um, people try that out. Yeah, absolutely, there's a lot of game developers and others who've played around with that idea. I think it's pretty clever. It's a nice way to engage some people. Um, there was SimCity and Sim Earth. actually, uh, was a companion game for a while, which was fun. Could you terraform Venus and make it habitable? If you could do that, you were a master class. I could do it. I, I actually did that. That was cool. Um, knew exactly what to do. Uh, but the other games were pretty fun. There was one called Fish Banks, which had you manage a fishery. Uh, it was pretty cool. And everybody um, on Facebook a few years ago, a lot of kids, a lot of adults were playing uh, Farmville. Uh, it was amazing. There are actually more people playing Farmville than there are farmers in America today. <laughs> Really, um, so that's sad, but interesting. So, um, and people have asked me like, what's the equivalent of like Tinder for the environment? Not only gaming, but like dating or you know other kind of social activities. I don't know, um, but you know, I'd love Silicon Valley to try to figure that out. Um, so, to just getting an app that helps you order burritos a little bit easier, uh, wouldn't it be cool to have something that saves the world? You know, that, that'd be cool. Um, that to me is kind of what I, mean, I hate to say this in a room in San Francisco area, but. The amount of money and talent and, you know, at, well, especially the talent, but, you know, and the dollars going into just useless technology. In Silicon Valley, it is absolutely, I don't even know what the hell it's for. And a lot of it's so counterproductive. I mean, it's basically replacing your mom. You know, like, give me a ride, order my food, do my laundry. You know, it's like, what? You know, these tech people are so lazy or something. I really, you can't do anything for yourself anyway. Don't get me started. Couldn't we adapt some of that to solving real pressing problems of the 21st century because some of the smartest people and billions of dollars are going into things that I just kind of wonder why are we doing this uh, and maybe games may sound frivolous but you know that that wouldn't be a bad first step is improving education if that's one way to do it let's do it maybe get kids more engaged um, so I guess one another question here I guess I'm just going where the mics are going oh yeah uh, well, Pla Planet Vision has uh, a lot of yeah uh, admirable visions uh, that uh -huh. the chance that all the optimism can merge collaboration and science and yep. and in all the, and greater values of people to achieve great results and really move things ahead uh, and then the depth of your response uh, in the, uh, to the questions about the the tides of negativity of uh, the decline of democracy you know that are affecting yeah. The achievability of these things uh, was really good, but you know, in addressing the, the dangers of polarization, uh, there, there is, in those forces, it is really important to both have the positive and then also have the metal to fight against. There is a darker wave that has billions of dollars behind it that's yep. going for 50 years mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of gone against science to create something that we're facing 
and I think that we all have to have a stronger mental to yep. uh, to get through it, you know, more than just the optimism, too. Uh, I totally agree. Um, that's why I tried it, and I didn't do it very well. I tried to uh, differentiate optimism from hope. Optimism is the belief in an invisible hand of some market force, you know, an invisible hand of technology or markets or something will swoop in and save the day. It's a fantasy. It's, the invisible hand isn't gonna change the world, it's these hands, it's your hands, all of our hands. And hope is different than optimism. Hope stares down the, you know, the very real possibility that we will fail and says, not today, not on my watch and has the medal you mentioned to say, no, I'm gonna stand up and say no to you. I might not win, but I'm gonna stop and say, I hope for a better world. I don't just think it's gonna happen and be optimistic. I'm gonna to dare to hope. I'm gonna actually put myself on the line and stand in front of that tank and say, not today. And that's a conscious act. That's a verb, that's, that's brave, that's bold. That's what we need. And so I think the definition of hope needs to be clearer. And I, I mean, it is a very active stance and opposition to darker forces that are frankly bad for future generations, bad for democracy, bad for what thousands of generations before us lived and died for. And we should honor their sacrifices and say, no, not today. We're not gonna erase what my parents and grandparents and yours and other, everyone in this room can look back on our ancestors and be proud of them. I want our descendants to look back at us and say, good on you. You did something great. You stood up against a very dark time in American history and said, not today. And we're gonna make it better. So that's, I agree, but that's what we need to do today. And hopeful, and, and to say, it is at least possible. I'm not giving up. We may not get there, but it is possible, but only because we stood and acted. And that's what I define hope to be. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, John, thanks. I think that's a great note to end on. A note of hope and possibility. So thank you all for coming. Let's give John a... Big round of applause. There are shuttles to help you with your transportation down to the car. You're also, we're giving out a beautiful poster with some of our events listed for the uh, new Estuary and Ocean Science Center. I hope you'll enjoy those. They'll be handed out on your way out. Take one, take two, share them with your friends. Come back and see us for the film festival. Come back and see us for next public forum. Thank you very much. Thank you.